Howdy! So today I wanted to pick up my reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, normally I'd be reading through Ezekiel, but I've just been seeing a lot of stuff uh, in my daily reading in Paul's epistles, and so um, I wanted to share out of this specific chapter today. So it says... Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Let the wife have not power of her own body but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by per permission, and not of commandment, for I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath, hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a, hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him. Let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister a brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called an uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keep, keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called, being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. Yet I give my judgment, as one, hath that, as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife, seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? wife see, seek not a wife. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoiced not, and they that buy as though they possessed not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is, a, there is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. 
But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age, and needs so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart, that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. So, it's a pretty big chapter. Um, covers a lot of topics. It's funny because considering how pervasive um, the concept of marriage is in society, marriage is actually not something that um, God spends a lot of time giving us doctrine about. Um, and this chapter kind of explains some reasons why. You know, one of the key chapters that everybody, I say everyone, most biblical-minded pastors use at a wedding is Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to go ahead and read that real quick. Um, this is um, speaking of Christ in the church. Ephesians 5, 24 through 33. 23 through 33. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So let's just pause here for a second. The context of everything that's about to follow is Jesus Christ being the head of the church um, and the church being subject to Jesus Christ in everything and that this lays out an example for a husband and a wife. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So let's pause here again. So what he's describing here is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us, all of the members of the body of Christ, and what Jesus Christ does for us every day by washing us through his word. In a similar sense, this is how a man should love his wife, that he um, helps perfect her, basically, and cleanse her through the Word of God. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this uh, after I finish reading this passage. Uh, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the Church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and though I see that she reverence her husband. So this, this chapter is very important. First of all, it sets up a framework for what a marriage is supposed to look like, um, what God hopes that every marriage will look like. Um, but I have had a lot of people in my life that got carried away with this and um, let's just say that they they didn't obey what it says here they um, got carried away with the concept of Christ in the church and they actually started treating their wife um, I guess from the perspective of, oh, I'm, I'm Christ, I'm God to you, and that's, that's not biblical, and in fact that's not what he's describing here, because he's describing a nourishing relationship, where you're serving them and you're giving yourself for them. That's not a, a relationship from a position of um, dominance, where you force them to do what you want and um, they're less than you. It's you esteeming your spouse better than yourself, just like we're supposed to do with every person, every fellow believer and every fellow man on the planet, even if they're not saved. Um, and what is the key here? In verses 32 and 33, he points out, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. So, 
what he's trying to get us to understand is a great mystery about Christ and the church. And that has reflections on what a marriage is supposed to look like. The truth here is Christ and the church. Um, and he says that because he doesn't want us to get caught up in, I guess, thinking of marriage above what it is. Um, they call marriage the holy matrimony. And it is definitely something that was ordained by God for a specific purpose, something that glorifies Him. But it has fallen far from that. And now what marriage often results it is more like is um, two imperfect people trying the best to uh, grow in faith together and grow in love together. A verse that I'm going to go to uh, after this, hopefully. And how do we know this? Because he says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. So he's not, the point of this isn't to say, um, you need to be, the father, dad needs to be Christ, and the wife needs to be the church. You know, it's a picture. The, the body of Christ and its relationship with Jesus Christ is the truth, the spiritual truth. And the marriage merely reflects that. But how we apply this, that's, that's the idea, that's the um, picture. But how we apply this is to the husband, what his focus needs to be, is loving the wife, even as himself. And the wife seeing that she reverence her husband. That's how we apply it. It's really simple. And it's not blown out of proportion. Um, it's not all these crazy absurd doctrines. One of the easiest traps to fall into with the Word of God is adding to the Word of God. And a lot of people add to this passage, um, turning marriage into something bigger than it is, when really it's just the husband loving the wife as himself and the wife reverencing the husband. And that's it. It's really simple. Um, so how does this tie back into 1 Corinthians 7? Well, <clears throat> the point of reading in Ephesians 5 is we get the ideal there, um, the ideal picture of what marriage is supposed to represent. Um, but... 1 Corinthians 7 deals with what marriage often actually looks like. It doesn't oft, usually it doesn't actually look like that. It doesn't look like Ephesians 5. Um, and in many instances, people who are married or unmarried find themselves in imperfect relationships where either the other person isn't doing the right thing or um, you're not married at all. And People who put an overemphasis on the holy matrimony might place the uh, expectation upon an unmarried individual, whether it be a female or a male, uh, that they get married at a certain point in their life because it's something that they're supposed to do. Or that if there's someone that they, air quote, fancy, that they should marry them. Um, and that's actually not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we're supposed to abide in the same calling when we're called. And in fact, Paul says that in this chapter like three or four times. Um, the chapter, does, it takes a much less glamorous viewpoint of marriage. It's a much more biblical, a more simple viewpoint. And it ends with something that isn't quite cynical. It's not a cynical perspective on marriage, but it's a biblical perspective on marriage. And that's really the key um, verse that kind of stuck out to me when I was reading this. And that's going to be verse down in verse uh, 29 through 31. And very few people um, like to hear this verse read because um, basically it tears down unbiblical expectations. It tears down idols. It tears down things that we trust in in this life that are not Jesus Christ, that are not in Jesus Christ. All of the idols and expectations and things we covet after in this life, it tears it down and it's basically redeem the time, walk in the spirit. And people don't want to hear that because people want to have this idol in their mind of what they think a marriage is supposed to look like and what they're supposed to get out of marriage, that they're supposed to get some sort of satisfaction and if they don't aren't getting that, then they're going to be upset. Marriage is not that, um, and as we've seen, marriage is not about what the other person is providing for you, it's about your responsibility as a wife to show reverence or as a husband to show love and nourishment. Um, it says, 
it says down in ver- 1 Corinthians seven twenty nine through 31 But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. What I want to point out very specifically are several things. Um, first of all, he says the time is short. And we've heard this a couple times, um, the time is short. We're supposed to put on the armor of God. We're supposed to redeem the time. Um, we're supposed to live godly. Uh, the time is short. You know, we are uh, living in a time where uh, there's a lot that God expects us to do, a lot of work that God has given us to do in the body of Christ, the perfecting of saints, work of the ministry, edifying of the body of Christ, charity, faith, hope, all these things, walking in the Spirit, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. This is work that He has for us to do. Um, And the worst possible thing that can happen and what Paul is about to, what God is about to remind us of in this chapter in the following verses, the verses following what I just read, is that the one of the worst possible things that can happen to a person is that they get distracted from their responsibility first and foremost and solely to God. Um, because everything else that we do in this life has to come from the desire to please God. Because if it doesn't, then it is often a snare. Um, now, Having said that, marriage can be a distraction, which is what Paul warns them of uh, down in verse 35. In this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. So there's, there's sort of this equilibrium here. Marriage can be a distraction, because what it often, often does is it pulls the mind of a believer who's weak in the faith, uh, it pulls their mind off of eternal things and pleasing God onto carnal things and pleasing another human being, their spouse. And one of the greatest downfalls in a marriage is allowing yourself to get so absorbed into trying to either please your spouse or be pleased by your spouse that then you become overly sensitive uh, to offenses and you became you become incapable of truly forgiving each other you get bitter um because you're always like uh did i did i hurt you or i you're always like miscommunicating or trying to figure out what the other person's thinking and it's just confusion and it's contention and it often ends poorly and leads to sorrow because it's not a biblical focus because there's no there's no desire of pleasing the Lord or edifying the other partner here. It's all about you know carnal things, temporal things. Now there is a balance though because marriage is good. Um, and I'm going to read hopefully that verse uh, after this, and then I'll read uh, the verse I mentioned earlier. They're both in First Timothy, two other verses on marriage. Um, marriage is good, and in fact we have freedom to get married or not get married um you know and that's what paul is saying here is that if a person can't contain it's better for them to marry than to burn marriage is how a person flees fornication and that temptation of the flesh to commit fornication with someone it's solved simply by getting married to them if you have someone that you fancy air quotes fancy don't fornicate with them, just get married to them and make a commitment to them that you will uh, engage in intimacy with them and them alone because that's how God intended it. And that is biblical and it's created by God for us to be received with thanksgiving and through belief of the word of God and prayer. Um, That's how we're supposed to receive it. And if we receive it in any other way, if we get married outside of thanksgiving and belief of the word of God and prayer, then often, unfortunately, it leads to carnality, and that's where you get 1 Corinthians 7. Because the first part of 1 Corinthians 7, he first addresses fornication, which is the topic of the previous chapter, 1 Corinthians 6. See, 1 Corinthians 7 comes off the tails 
of 1 Corinthians 6 because 1 Corinthians 6 is talking about fornication. We're not here to commit fornication. Our body is not for the purpose of fornicating. It's for God. That's what we are for. Um, but God has given us a way to flee fornication by getting married. Um, however, often um, people who get married solely off of the desire to engage in intimacy, uh, it leads to carnality, um, which is what unfortunately has to be addressed in this chapter about divorce. Uh, if there are two biblically minded people, there's no reason for them to get divorced, which is what he talks about. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Um, but that's two biblically minded people. If you have one carnal and the other walking in the spirit, the, per the motivation of the one walking in the spirit is not to change their state. It's to continue following their responsibilities as a husband or a wife, regardless of what the other person chooses to do, up until the point that the other person decides to put an end to the relationship, to depart. Whether that is through physically leaving, or you know, committing some sort of crime or violent act, anything that could be seen as them no longer being pleased to dwell with you. Um, and at the end of the day, it really comes down to uh, between you and God. And the, the key theme of this, though, is being c content, abiding in the same calling where you're called. And why is that important? Because when a person is not content, they get married out of a lack of contentedness. They are not abiding in the same calling when they're called. Um, that's when marriage leads to carnality. But when they are praying and being thankful for the state that they're in and God shows them however it is that he does that that their calling is now to be married then that actually is the type of um, attitude that leads to a biblical marriage that will last um, and what is a biblical marriage look like well there's a verse in first Timothy it says <clears throat> in first Timothy 2 15. The context of this is a woman. He's talking about a woman um, being subject um, and to not usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Why? Because uh, the woman was first deceived and that pattern has been carried on throughout all of human history. That um, females, unfortunately, um, have a tendency to allow themselves to, be, their emotions to be easily manipulated um, or they find themselves often uh, regularly facing emotional instability as it were and there's you know chemical reasons for that and just that's part of the way that it's been since the beginning of history and men have their own problems God uh, commands men to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting three things that men are going to struggle with. Lifting up holy hands, so being blameless before God and praising Him, and then turning into prayer blamelessly before Him, and then wrath and doubting. Men have a temptation to doubt themselves, and they also have a temptation to be given to wrath. And there are things that he warns the women about as well. This isn't a sexist thing, this is just him, God, giving us instructions about the specific temptations that we all face and providing commands and structures to help us deal with those temptations in a biblical way. Now, what's the verse I want to look at? It's verse 15. It says, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, what does this mean? She's going to be saved in childbearing. That sounds sexist. Well, anybody that's had a child or known anybody that's had a child understands the um, difficult time that um, the mother goes through. And I'm not going to say it's not hard on the father, it definitely is, but it's most difficult on the mother. And during the time of childbearing um, are established patterns that may continue throughout the remainder of that marriage or even the life of the two spouses. Um, hard feelings, bitterness, contention, all of that happens during childbearing because of the type of uh, uh, temptations that the mother will face just because of how she feels 
um, the type of physical sickness that she endures, um, the changes in her body, uh, the changes in her mind, the changes in her hormones, um, all of those are attacks. And they're enough to cause a person to become very carnal very quickly if they're not walking in the spirit. And part of the p purpose of the husband and wife being joined together is so that together they can get through this. And how do they get through that difficult time of childbearing? It says right here, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So that's the pattern of a good marriage right there. Um, that is how you set up a marriage for success. The husband and wife together must continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Faith is believing the word of God and speaking it. Charity is um, the love of God. And then also all of the things it describes about charity. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. So there you go. That's charity. And that describes a marriage very well, a biblical marriage, of what each, both the husband and the wife are supposed to be doing to each other and everyone that they come in contact with. They need to be continuing in those two things. And also holiness with sobriety. Holiness, we talked about this before, holiness is cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That means that we're constantly fearing God and allowing the knowledge that He is, He will judge us, and allowing that fear to cause us to repent and cleanse ourselves from filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Bad thoughts, bad attitudes, and bad works. Works of the flesh. We cleanse ourselves from that. And together, the husband and wife are walking in holiness. And then sobriety, walking in the spirit, having a sober mind. Not allowing your flesh or your emotions to rule you or your mind, but allowing the Holy Spirit to rule you and direct you. And this is not only how a woman makes it through childbearing without being badly affected or developing an animosity t toward her husband because of the things that she has to suffer and the ways that she feels um, and she will be hurt by her husband during that time frame because she becomes more sensitive to certain things where maybe the husband didn't mean to hurt her or maybe he did because he didn't have a very good patience. Either way, part of charity is to forgive. Um, and so this is really the structure and the pattern for a successful marriage. And when we talk about how if a marriage has to be engaged in biblically in order for it to be, uh, in order for it to turn out well, other than, you know, the carnal things that we saw in 1 Corinthians 7, this is the pattern that it needs to follow. Um, because we do have liberty to get married. Um, and I'm going to read this other verse in 1 Timothy, then I'm going to go back to 1 Corinthians um, 7. So I'm going to hop over to 1 Timothy 4, um, 1 through 5. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay, so what does this mean? Latter times. That should remind us of something. The time is short. Latter times and time is short are connected because we the time is short. The Lord is coming quickly. And there are people giving heed to the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And what are these seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? Well, that's just things in the world that are not of God, um, that draw you away from the truth of the word of God, that try and seduce us. We talked about false prophets before in other vlogs. What is it that they're doing? They're speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Okay, so the people who give heed to these seducing spirits, these bad doctrines, um, they speak lies and hypocrisy. So that means um, they say things that are against the truth, but they do it hypocritically so. They violate their own commandments. The commandments that are against the truth, they violate their own commandments, even though those commandments are against the truth in the first place. They have their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now this can mean two things. First and foremost, when your conscience is seared, this is the way it's being used here, because um, that's what the context is laying out. When your conscience is seared with a hot iron, 
it means that your conscience is greatly offended by things that it shouldn't be offended by, like marriage and meats, which we have liberty in which God created for us to receive with thanksgiving of us, hopefully, if we believe and know the truth. Hopefully we do believe and know the truth, and we can receive these things, marriage and meats, with thanksgiving. But these people who have given heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, they can't receive them because their conscience is seared. They're offended by marriage. They're offended by meats. And so they forbid to marry. It's like, you know, nuns or, um, you know, priests or whatever. And I know that they don't do this so much anymore, but there are people in this world who are like, the responsibility of getting marriage is too great. I mean, I can't get married because all of these responsibilities, I have to do this, I have to have insurance, I have to have a job that looks like this, I have to have a house that looks like this, I have to do all these, get all these check marks, therefore I can't get married, and so my conscience is seared because I've given heed to seducing spirits. Why? Because all of those things I just mentioned are made trusting in my flesh, it's carnality, it's not trusting in God. Marriage is of God, and it's created by God to be received with thanksgiving, and none of that other stuff. But a person who's exalting those commandments of men, the traditions of men in their mind, I can't get married because I don't have all these things. I don't have the money. I don't have the insurance. I don't, I'm just not a good enough person. And it's like, you're giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And so your conscience is seared in something that you should be able to have faith in. Um, but the other consequence of having your conscience seared with a hot iron is that you then become numb. It, you, uh, you stop being able to uh, differentiate between good and bad. And your conscience, when it's burned in one thing, it offends you, it greatly offends you, but then the offense it kind of trickles away because when your conscience isn't ruled by truth, it's ruled by what offends me, my emotions then it allows you to basically start allowing other things. Whereas you were overly restrictive, overly conservative, overly legalistic, not allowing marriage or eating of meat before because your conscience offended you, now your conscience is seared and it's become numb so that you do allow some things that God didn't intend to allow, that we don't have liberty in because you were not ruled by knowing and believing the truth. Um, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. What does this mean? Every creature of God is good. So when we eat meat, whether it's a deer or a turkey, we can eat it with thanksgiving because we believe that there is one God and that Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. That's why we give thanks when we eat, that's why we pray, and that's why we read and believe the word of God. Because it helps us have faith in these things that we have liberty in. But this also means something else. That every creature of God is good. It's not just referring to animals, it's also referring to people. It's like, if I want to get married, and I look at a person and I say, Oh, this person's flawed or this person doesn't have a job. This person, you know, they're, are they good husband material? Are they good wife material? It's like, I despise a creature of God because of my own judgments, because of the traditions of men, the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, the legalism and bad doctrine that is in my head. I'm despising this creature of God and saying, I can't marry that. I can't get married to that. It's like, replace that with faith. And what does faith tell us? It tells us that if you approach it biblically, then the marriage is good. But at the same time, you don't have to get married. You can abide in the same calling where you're called, if you do it with God. It's not about um, if you're having struggles um, in the calling where you're called with fornication, um, like the temptation, um, then maybe you need to examine yourself and work out some things in your current state before you make a decision like getting married. Um, and the same the same thing goes the other way around. Um, but to, to every creature of God is good, it also refers to people. Um, because when two get married, it's like 
that also is a creature of God. Marriage itself is a creature of God. And it is to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. You see, outside of the word of God in prayer, it's not sanctified, which makes it unclean. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. That's, um, that's a very clear statement. If it's not of faith, if it's not of the word of God in prayer, then when we partake in it, we are damned. And I'm not t talking about eternal damnation. We're not talking about salvation, eternal security, all that stuff. But we are talking about condemnation, damnation when we appear before God. That He will judge us for the evil that we have done in our bodies. We know that it will happen to every believer. Even though we are saved and have the Holy Spirit sealing us, crying out the Father in our hearts. I'm kind of being cognizant of the time. I don't want this to go too long. So I'm going to jump back over to 1 Corinthians 7. Um, and hopefully try to wrap it up a little bit. I may go one other place. Um, so going back to 1 Corinthians 7 verse 29 through 31. Um, it's important to note from where we just were in 1 Timothy and where we are here in 1 Corinthians. Marriage is compared with meats. What are meats? Um, meats back then were like meats offered unto idols. It was food that was unclean because it was offered unto an idol and so it was sold for less. Now a person with a weak conscience would say that was offered unto an idol, I can't eat that because I don't want to be an idolater. But God's telling us we have liberty, it doesn't matter. It's faith, God created it whether it was offered to an idol or not. And in the same sense it's like TV shows, TV shows that have some sort of sketchy agenda behind them, some sort of uh, political agenda that they're trying to push, or like movies that have bad topics in them, like violence or homosexuality or any of this stuff, it's like, oh I can't watch that, it offends my conscience. It's like, it's just a movie, it's just a movie. You are not the one doing those things if you pray about it and if you believe the Word of God and allow the Word of God and prayer to sanctify that movie or that music or that meat, that food or that activity that you're going to do, all of these things are aspects of meats. It's just uh, things in this life that are unclean or have aspects of uncleanness in them but that we can have faith in because God has given us liberty in all of these things, whether it's a certain day or an event or a movie or a type of behavior um, or just a hobby, all of these things, it's like meats. So marriage is compared with that, back in 1 Timothy 4. What is marriage compared with here? It's compared to fashions of the world. It's compared with people who that buy or buy not. People that weep or weep or rejoice. Um, and so this gives us this idea of marriage that is not necessarily different than Ephesians 5, but it's more, um, let's just say practical. I shouldn't even say that because Ephesians 5 is key for understanding the purpose and the way a marriage is supposed to look biblically, um, the goal that we should have. However, um, what marriage actually is in this world is not Christ in the church. It's unfortunately just a decision. That's all it is. It's something that you either choose to partake in or you don't. And what he says here is that they that buy are as they that possess not. And that they that are married, they that have wives, be as though they had none. That means that getting married does absolutely nothing for a person. It doesn't make you better in God's eyes. And the same with being unmarried. You're not worse in God's eyes if you're not married. That's the thing about meat. Meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Not meat and drink. Uh, I'm going to go over there. Uh, Romans 14. <clears throat> it says, 17 and 18. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. And in the same context, we're talking about marriage as well. 
just like we saw. If it's done biblically in faith, which is connected with peace, by the way, righteousness is connected with charity, and joy is connected with hope, two of which are the things that we saw over in 1 Timothy 2 about what a biblical marriage has to look like. So two of those things, if it's done in those things, is pleasing to God. But that goes for anything in this life. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That is what makes us acceptable to God. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. And that's everything. Not just marriage, but also marriage included. If it's in those things, it's acceptable. If it's not, then it's not acceptable. And that's what commends us to God. That's what God, God is pleased by. Because that's what He does inside of us. And marriage is just... It's just a decision. Unfortunately, if we read the grammar here, he says, They that have wives be as though they had none. Semicolon. They that weep be as though as though they wept not. Semicolon. They that rejoice as though they rejoice not. Semicolon. They that buy as though they possess not. Semicolon. And they that use this world as not abusing it. Colon. For the fashion of this world passeth away. Semicolon, 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 colon. So all of those things are a list, and at the end we have an equivalent. That the statement at the end, the fashion of this world passeth away, is equal to all of the four things that he mentions. All of those things are aspects of the fashion of this world. Marriage included. And just think about that, because we like to call marriage the holy matrimony. And it truly does picture something holy in God's eyes. But really it's just a fashion of this world. We have liberty to buy or not buy. Liberty to weep or not weep. Rejoice or not rejoice. To be married or not be married. We do it in faith. But the act itself isn't necessarily good or bad in God's eyes. It's just a fashion of this world. And in the end all of those things pass away. This really gets into this idea a lot of people in media like to push this idea, and I think in Christianity as well, that um, husband and wife are somehow linked eternally, and um, we all are part of the body of Christ. That's just a fact. Um, we all are linked. If we are saved, we're linked eternally, um, except, of course, those who are um, judged uh, for their evil at the judgment seat of Christ, and God cuts them off. Uh, they will not be part of the body of Christ for eternity. They will be uh, in shame for eternity. However, they will not be in hell. They will not be suffering at damnation. But they will be suffering shame um, and destruction because of their evil works. But a husband and wife, what they their function is limited primarily to this life. Now, a husband and wife, they become one flesh. Um, but we ultimately are all one in Christ. So what does that mean? Are they closer? Well, any member, like the body of Christ works, some members are closer to others. Some are joined with certain members, and other members they're farther away from, just because of their, their function. Where their function is in the body of Christ, they're closer to some members. And if you're married to someone, then you're really close to that member of the body of Christ. But remember, they're joined with Christ first, and you second. And that join with Christ, that connection with Christ, that's the eternal one that lasts, not the connection with you. You're just a fellow member of the body of Christ, although you are more than that because you are bound in one flesh. You're supposed to be fulfilling God's purpose for you and her as an individual together, as a joint unit, as one flesh. But um, it's really all part of this idea of the body of Christ. So when we die, and go to heaven, and we're with Christ, we are still part of his body. It's not just people who die, they're the single people walking around by themselves, all lonely, and then the married people who are happy and having a good time because they got their spouse there with them in heaven. That's not how it works. We're still part of the body of Christ. You're just closer to this member because you were married with him. If, if they also were preserved unblameable unto his coming, if they did what they're supposed to do, if they're carnal, they're cut off too. Um, and you don't have joy of them. Whether that's a spouse, a fellow believer, a family member, 
Um, so that gets into the uh, judgment seat of Christ. We've already gone over this um, many times. But um, really what I want to emphasize here is that he says that she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. What is that judgment? It says, um, Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. And again, um, he says, Art thou, uh, Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. And again, brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. And again, it says, um, uh, For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper, hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. Um... I feel like it said it one more time. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. Um, it's abide in the calling where you're called, and not everybody believe. Not everybody comes to the knowledge of the truth at the same time. Some people, by the time they've come to the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge of this this truth that God has given us in 1 Corinthians 7, they're already married, and their marriage is already screwed up. Um, and it's abide there. You are married. Obey God, and continue in faith. Continue in holiness with sobriety, and charity, and faith. Righteousness, peace, joy, thanksgiving. Continue in those things where you are. Don't seek to change your state. There's a condition in which you have to change your state, and that's if the the carnal person, the unbelieving, depart if they not if they be not pleased to dwell with you. But barring that, be content. Abide where you're called. Same thing goes for an unmarried person. Same things goes for you know a servant, somebody who's working full time versus somebody who hasn't yet settled in. You know, one of the things that um, God commands us. <clears throat> In 2 Timothy 2, 4, 2, 3 and 4, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And so, um, the act of being entangled, um, it could be simply by engaging in an activity that does entangle, such as fornication, um, or uh, any type of sin. But there are some things that don't necessarily entangle us, but they can. It comes down to whether we do them in faith or not. And our calling, whether we're servant or free, whether we're married or unmarried, that's something that can entangle us if we don't approach it in faith. Um, which is why it's so important to have our focus on pleasing God first. Whether it's marriage or anything that we do. But marriage specifically, it has to, our focus has to be pleasing God, because at the end of the at the end of the day, marriage to God, it's just a decision, you know, and it's either done in faith or not, and um, it's important to not add too much weight to that, because when you do, you cheat. Uh, yourself and you cheat God from what he expects of us every day in what at whatsoever state we are called and we start feeling like we're obligated entangled with whatever decision or state it is that we're in we stop forgetting that we do have the liberty to please God whatever state we're in um, it's like no matter and a lot of times we start I'm just gonna say when our mindset gets carnal, we start looking at things like, say, if we're married, um, and we start saying, oh, I have a failed marriage. I have a bad marriage. And it's like that's an entanglement in our mind. It tears us down. It makes us feel sorrowful or angry or depressed or cynical or stressed out all the time. I have such a failed marriage, and that's the only thing I can think about. That's an entanglement with the affairs of this life because it's taken place inside of our hearts because instead of being thankful 
And instead of believing the word of God and continuing in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety in our own life, like God commands us to do, we got our mind set off. We got caught up in the distractions and affairs and fashions of this life. We put more stock in those the physical circumstances and situations than we should have. Um, and that's really um, sort of the moral of the story here, is it's like marriage, just like anything in this life, it's not good, it's not bad. It has to do with what we have inside of us when we approach it. Whether we do it in faith, be giving thanks to God, believing the Word of God and praying, or if we do it because we're distracted, we're caught up in the thoughts and expectations and traditions of men. Wives tales is another type of thing. Jewish fables. All these things, the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Things that get inside of our mind and inside of our heart that are not of the Word of God. They're not of the Holy Spirit. They're from something else. And, um, marriage just like anything if we enter into it with all that stuff inside of our heart it's gonna it's gonna cause some serious suffering um and marriage of all the types of decisions we can make in this life is so easily uh it easily manifests the carnality uh it easily manifests the thoughts and act motivations we had inside of us when we began or that we had when we you know, went through a trying time like childbearing. Um, because if we didn't do it in faith, it manifests that pretty dang quickly. Um, it's kind of like, you know, that uh, canary in the coal mine. You know, the marriage is a perfect, uh, it perfectly re represents what's going on inside of a person's heart. However, however, a marriage with somebody in a less than ideal situation can still be pleasing to God. It doesn't have to be contentious. It doesn't have to be um, stressful or depressing because even in a marriage that is deeply flawed, a person can still say, I'm going to walk in faith today. I'm going to walk in sobriety. I'm going to walk in charity. I'm going to walk in holiness. I'm going to walk in faith. Um, I'm going to walk in believing the Word of God. I'm going to walk in thanksgiving. And if they do that, regardless of what their spouse or partner chooses to do, they can please God. And that's hopeful. And that is um, a happy thought. And that's very encouraging. Because there, there and you abide. When you do that, you abide in the calling wherein God has called you. And it pleases, it pleases God. Um, and let's just be honest here more often than not you know marriage is going to fall short of this picture of christ in the church we have to be able to have in ourselves the desire to please god and not be tripped up by constantly thinking constantly getting discouraged or caught up and saying oh man my marriage doesn't look as good as that person on the tv show i was watching like Grey's anatomy or man, why is my relationship always so... We're always constantly having to apologize and forgive each other. Well, good! Because if you're having to forgive each other, then you're having to practice charity. You're having to practice love. Because love is forgiveness, is it not? That's the, what the love that Christ showed toward us. You know, marriage is like... It's just another opportunity to show love. To show good works. The fruit of the Spirit have that be worked outward it tests you but it also can manifest good things if you're walking in the spirit if you're not it just manifests bad things and again it's like let's not set our expectations way up here that's what the world does then they get mad at each other it's like why aren't you meeting my expectations why aren't you doing this, this, and this? I'm going to be mad and bitter at you because you're not doing what I thought you were supposed to do as a spouse. That's seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Um, our expectation is like, you know what? Stop paying attention to what your spouse is doing. Pay attention to what you're supposed to be doing. Get that right. 
And if they do the right thing, then they do the right thing. If they don't, they don't. And if they depart, let them depart. That's just the way it is. None of that has to tie you down or be an entanglement to you. You continue walking in the Spirit, walking in charity, walking in faith, holiness with sobriety, thanksgiving. You're going to be pleasing God. And that life, that time you spent in maybe a not-so-great marriage, that's going to be pleasing to God too if you did it in biblical attitudes and faith. All that time, it's not going to be wasted. It pleases God, too. That's the thing about this life. The days are evil. We redeem, we redeem the time. The days are evil. We're never going to find ourselves in perfect situations. Most ideal situations. We live in a fallen world. If we don't have it inside of ourselves to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, there's no place for us in this world. And we're not going to be profitable to God. He's put us here for a reason. And we are supposed to endure hardness so that we can redeem the time. Nobody else is going to redeem it for us. We can't just sit back. We've got to be ready to put on the armor of God, to walk in the Spirit, and to have charity. Um, regardless of what we endure. And if we do those things, regardless of what the world may think, we will please God. And who cares about what the world thinks? The fashion of the world fades away. So, that's really just the moral of the story um, from what I get out of my reading in 1 Corinthians 7. Hopefully it encourages anybody listening to this. The fashion of the world fades away. Our focus needs to be on pleasing God, not on the fashion of the world. Anyway, that's what I get out of uh, 1 Corinthians 7.